Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. Um, touchstones on the path is what I'm calling the talk and the uh, experience that I hope to give to you today, the lesson. Because I was inspired by Reverend Michael last week when he talked about the five unity principles, and I love the way that he made them so concise. God is... I am, I am equipped, I, cre I create, I am equipped, and um, I live it. So these are ways in which we recognize that what we learn, the truth that we have, is really an alive thing. Because you see, unity doesn't have a creed, and it doesn't really have a dogma. It doesn't have anything that requires that you must believe to be here. We are, in fact, open and constantly seeking truth wherever we find it, in whatever ways that we feel that resonance deep within us. When we feel the movement of spirit, we cultivate that experience in our meditation time so that we recognize it when we're going about our lives in the world, when we get those chill bumps, right? Those chill bumps that come out of nowhere. When we speak the truth, when we hear the truth, when somebody says something true, true and real and touching from our hearts, when our hearts are on fire, when we feel those things moving in us, we can begin to trust and believe in those things, knowing that whatever that is, it is creating a resonance of the truth of who we already are. And so really what we think our journey is about is uncovering that and sharing that with the world, of recognizing and, and being um, raised up in that process. So today, um, uh, I wanted to, um, to remind you that, that dogma and creed has always been sort of our guiding post if we've come up in a, in a faith tradition or a, or a religion. Um, if we've been, had a religious life. But there are many other examples of where um, groups have been guided by this deepening and this awareness of who they really are. And in 12-step recovery, in my introduction to it, recovering people share their experience, strength, and hope based on their lives and, and what has helped them and what, um, what steps they've taken to to have a, a sober life or a change in their life, a transformed life. In fact, the big book of AA was formed by the experience of people putting together how the steps they took to get there and how it was that their lives were changed and transformed. That didn't come from the finger of God writing on a stone tablet. It is, in fact, something that is written upon our hearts. And it is up to us to discover that when we are truly committed to understanding what our purpose is and how we can live the life we were meant to live. Thanks, Diane. <laughs> Don Miguel Ruiz uh, wrote a best-selling book, uh, The Four Agreements. And he, in that book, he outlined a very simple map for living a peaceful, integrated, respectful life in the lineage of the shamanic, uh, shamanic tradition of his family. And as he did that, that book of four little, um, four little agreements that one would make, or, or guideposts in a way, to one's life, would help somebody become, um, have greater integrity, have more peace, begin to order how it is that you live, and it became a, a runaway bestseller. In the shamanic tradition, it is um, a part of the, um, I, I would say, of the, of the way that shamans work, that when they encounter a new thing, a new idea or a new um, element of some kind, it is called um, um, shamanic dieting or ingestion. And so they prepare their bodies, they prepare their minds, their spirit, they move into a time of ceremony and of openness, and they will take whatever this element is and take a tiny bit into their mouths if it's something 
tangible something that they can ingest. Um, they will take it on a shamanic journey where they open themselves to it. They will go through um, a process possibly of shape-shifting into it to understand it, to commune with it, to try to grok it at some level from, from the front, from the back, from the top, from the side, from the inside, outside, all of that so that they can understand what it is and what its medicine is. And you're sitting there thinking, well, it could be poison. Well, poison is medicine too. There are many poisons that we ingest that are meant to be in treatments, right? I know you know that. So there's a lot to understand about how it is that ingesting things and digesting them through the experience of our lives is where we synthesize the wisdom that we live by. And that's why I felt you might want to hear my touchstones that I'm using. Um, right now, I'll say that uh, this is what I have come to learn from the, the teachings that I have taken in and the ones that I have practiced and tried for a while. And, and it's sort of like my, my working theory on how, how to live. Uh, a working theory um, in scientific terms, I have a, a bit of a science background, is that you're, you're constantly holding a premise, you hold a premise that you try to test in the world and you, and you look for evidence for it and you look for evidence against it. You really want to test it to see, does this hold water? Is this really useful? And you publicize it and you talk about it so other people can also bring their experience and, and you look for evidence to change and morph as you get new evidence or as you get new insight. That's the scientific way because it doesn't, they're not trying to hold on to a way of what is right and what is wrong, um, that I have the truth and you don't. They are trying to share it with the world and they are trying to refine it because no one person at any given time has the whole truth. We're always seeking the truth. We do it through scientific methods, but we do it in our spiritual lives as well. We are truth seekers. And so as you consider the things in your life that have taught you, the things that you know for sure, just know that in the pursuit of something more, in the pursuit of your next great insight, being open and receptive is a way in which you too can grow and, and expand even more than you already have. For me, the one that I always go back to is peace is the goal. I always remind myself, peace is the goal in this moment, in this experience, in this mess that I'm confronting, in this challenge, in this confusion, in this pain. Where is it? Where can I, where can I rest? What can I stand on? And for me, it is remembering that the peace is already here, that even with things swirling around me and, and changing and, and not the way I want by any stretch, people not behaving the way they ought to behave, right? Whatever. That I don't have to be um, in upset, I don't have to be lost, I don't have to be in pain, hurting. Pain will come, pain goes, but suffering is a choice. I don't need to hang on to it and suffer until they finally see it my way because that's where my suffering and my resistance comes from. Instead, I can let go of all of those things and instead, instead go into my heart and try to breathe into where is the peace now? And then I realize very often what the limits of my power are to make change in, outside of me or in somebody else's life or control the situation. That's why I've been suffering. That's why I've been upset because I haven't seen how far I can actually go that can make a difference. But when I do, I'm at peace. And a lot of times it helps me just to stand and be supportive of the ones who are experiencing things that they need to learn what their power is and how to use it. This is a, um, a, a touchstone for me. And in fact, it is so central. It is the first one that I use. And sometimes it's, it takes care of most of the situations that I encounter. But I want you to know that peace is not passivity 
or inactivity or withdrawal from the world. I'm not talking about that. I'm not saying go, uh, just remove yourself from every situation that bothers you or upsets you. That may be a strategy and that might be necessary in some cases, but it is not the, necessarily the go-to. Sometimes it is possible for us to just recognize that having it within us and beginning to resonate and orient ourselves to the peace within us is a part of the answer for the situation at hand. It is, peace is not dependent upon what one does or doesn't do. It is only how present one is to one's deep beingness. Seriously, that's really it. It's just withdrawing and sinking down deep into your heart. This informs what you do and what you say and how you are. And there is an element of peace that begins to pervade and the other will resonate with it. Because why? Peace is all of our true nature. It is the, where our beingness is rooted. So when I'm being peace, then no matter what I say or do or don't say or don't do, in some ways I'm radiating um, a, a state, um, a resonance that will start to vibrate within that other person. And with, therein lies the hope for something different to occur within the scope of their power, within the scope of their life. This is how we affect and change things. And so you saw me um, uh, know also that, that peace is not dependent on peaceful, harmonious, or orderly conditions, right? Like we're all thinking that someday, when the world is at peace, we're going to be at peace too, right? I mean, there's that, that la-la feeling that we're always praying for world peace. And, and I have a picture. The whole world is completely at, at peace and static <laughs> in a way. And, but that's not, day is not going to come because we wait for the next shoe to drop, don't we? Because something will. Something will shift and change because the world changes. Peace is not going to come from the world. It is gonna come into the world from us. And that is the only way it ever does. And so in knowing what it is and how it is that you can touch the peace in yourself, then therein lies the opportunity to bring it to the world. So I'm just gonna invite you to, to join me in that little exercise I tried with the kids and just invite you just to take a moment now and just take a, a deep breath in and then just gently drone this drone. And you feel that vibration in the center of your being, in that deep center where you, where inside of you is this opportunity to withdraw from thought, withdraw from the world, withdraw from all the things that are, have excited your mind and your, your, your choices um, have upset you perhaps. Um, the, things that, the things that you want to change or shift, you let all of that go and you just remember that right here, right now, there is order, there is peace, and you can be it. You can feel it. It's an opportunity just to practice finding it. Because once we find the peace, then the next touchstone I like to use is that the question that arises for me is what is mine to do and how do I do it? If I find peace, it's like now what? And I remember that love is the way. Love is always the way. Love is the only way. And it is not wimpy. Love is also not passive. Love is the most powerful, amazing strength that you have in you, is whenever you have allowed your heart to open to the point of expressing the love that you are, you cannot be shook. You cannot be overtaken. You cannot 
um, be overcome. Love is the thing that is the strongest um, power you will ever exercise. It is freedom and expansiveness of the heart. It's the ability to see the innocence underneath all the bad behavior or about the threatening behavior or whatever else is going on that we can see deep down how sad it would be that if I were in that person's position and saying those things and being that in the world, how much pain must that person be in to create that much pain in the world? As soon as I'm aware of that, as soon as I'm able to withdraw it, I immediately can go underneath it and see the child or see the innocence, to see the confusion. They don't know what else to do and they're doing what they've always done. So love is the opportunity for me to see with different eyes so that my words become penetrating into what is happening in their life and in mine. It helps to, me to feel an expansion of the heart. It is the key to forgiveness and letting go is breathing into it and recognizing that the, the shift, the change, can actually happen with me being in my heart and feeling the love. Love is not transactional. It is not me to you, this one and not that one, that I'm selective, that it's only the people I like or the only the people I'm willing to live with or whatever. Love is a state of being. And in that state of being comes all the power, all the opportunity to be able to really be um, a force for the world, to change it, transform it, to heal it. This is what we are called to do and to be. I want to also say what love is not. It is not weakness. It is the strongest power you'll possess. It is not wishy-washy permissiveness. It is responsibility for setting boundaries for healthy relationships. Love sometimes does the thing that in the moment feels unloving to you and sometimes the other person agrees. Don't set a boundary there, but you know it is and it has to happen. That's love will guide you. Love is the strength that allows you to do that. And it's not willful blindness or denial. It clearly sees what is lovable and true beyond behavior and belief system that a person may be operating from. The power from which all spiritual power arises is love. Love is the bedrock of all the other spiritual powers we have. This state of being, of love, moves out from us and creates a field. And it is a resonant field of love, of healing, of power. And it is the way in which we were always meant to live. This isn't attainment of some Buddha or some master teacher. It is your capacity, and you touch it all the time. When, you are, when your heart is melted by the face of someone you do love, someone you already have that relationship with, it draws the love out of you. It resonates with love. When you treat someone with that kind of respect and openness and willingness to see who they really are, that is an act of love. And out of that, truth is all that matters. Because the questions that I ask myself now are, what is it that I need to see in this experience? What is it that needs to shift or change? What is really happening here? Have you had that? Where you're just not really sure how you got here. How did this get to be like that? And there is an opportunity for us to move into capital T truth, a truth that we can begin to understand. Discerning what is true and what is always true and how it informs what's happening leads me to find the choices in my world, in my moment, that helps me to navigate. It cuts through the illusion, the confusion. When Jesus was on trial, Pilate said, you are a king then. And Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Pilate said, what is truth? 
The thing that has always haunted me is in reading that and hearing that. Even in the Catholic Church, I wondered why Jesus didn't answer him. And now I think I know. Because there isn't an answer, is there? Truth is what we discern. Truth is in the, in the eye of the beholder, in the heart of the one who's willing to receive it, to recognize it. Truth is our own individual seeking. It's our own individual search. No one else can give it to us. They can say it all day long, up and down. But until we're ready to hear it or receive it, until we're ripe for it, we may not recognize it. So seek the deepest truth you know for sure by asking in whatever situation that you're confronting, what is beneath this? Over and over, what is beneath this now? What is underneath here until you see the true nature of the situation? And then ask, what is it exactly that I'm seeing? And know that what you're seeing in this moment is the truth. Truth is that resonance, that, that feeling that something gives you the chills and you know that truthfulness is there. So the deal is, that as we discern what is true, we speak the truth with love whenever we can and allow it to do its work. Absolute truth is deep within us and it is unchanging. Absolute truth doesn't need you to believe it to be true. It'll wait on you to be ready to align with it. It is a function of peace and love and other absolute principles of the universe, whenever you're able to get back to peace or love, truth will be there too. So as you open your heart, as you practice finding the peace or being love or stepping into that, you will also know what is deeply true in yourself. What, it, what is it that is needing to be revealed? And then finally, the fourth thing, service is my purpose. That's the answer to the question of, once I have some of these practices, why am I here? What does, why does any of this matter? What is the meaning of my small temporary life? Is it just for me to live a better life, the best life I can? That's what I've been focused on. But at some point, we recognize that, in fact, all of this has meant that it's our opportunity to shine and to allow our love to, to enter into the world purposefully, that our consciousness of peace heals, that our uh, truth that we know and speak will enable others to also resonate with it and grow as they will as time goes on. You know, you may think that service in the world is being a teacher or being a, a, a preacher or being somebody who, who has it all together, who's, who's speaking it out from a platform or stage. I don't have it all together. I have a working theory, you just heard it. But what it is is that we are all p capable of radiating the love that comes from an infinite source. When I was a hospice chaplain, I met a man who had been in, had, he was comatose when I met him on our, hospice, um, on our hospice list. And I heard the other staff members speaking of him and how when they walked into his room, they felt peace. They felt, they saw light in the room. They saw light coming from him where he was motionless and just breathing. He was at peace and, and at ease for most of the time. He did have some episodes from time to time, but most of it. He was at peace. You saw the picture of him in his business suit, smiling with family on, on the wall. But now, here he is in this bed, and he's just breathing, doing nothing, saying nothing, not aware it doesn't appear, not looking, eyes closed, just breathing. And the people on my team would say that sometimes they would 
slip away when they would be in that particular site when they were seeing other patients and go into his room and just sit there with him. Not for his sake, but for theirs. To be in the presence. It was like entering a chapel. It was so quiet and yet so full at the same time. That is the image that I hold. That is the image that I send you with in thinking about the difference that you make in the world. No matter how busy or twisted up or weird your life might be, how many things you've got going, how active or busy, upset, how many decisions you have to make, it isn't what's going on in your mind. It is what's going on in your heart. And wherever you can stop and break and, and slip down into your heart, therein will lie your peace, your love your truth, and service will be the thing. So I invite you now to join me. Let us pray. Let us know that in this moment, peace arises. Let us have this peace that arises up through us and out into the world with every word, with every action, with just, just our very presence. Let us now also know that love with our next breath comes from an infinite source beyond us, within us, through us, and as us. Let us also know that the vibration of truth resonates within us and we see truth wherever we look. We know also that as we are here for service, for sharing who and what we are, let our words, our actions, our presence bless the world. And so it is, amen. So if no one has told you that they love you today, I want you to know that I do. And you know why? Because all I can see right here, right now, is love. Many blessings. God bless you all. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org. Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.